My name is Joffrey Sane. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about asynchronous JavaScript at Netflix. Um, first, just a little bit about who I am. I'm the uh, cross-team technical lead for the Netflix UI, so I work across all of our various Netflix UIs. Uh, I'm a member of the TC39, um, and uh, I've got about 13 years in the industry. I formerly worked at Microsoft and GE, and I've got about six years of experience building large systems with functional reactive programming. And really, I'm here to talk to you about the story of how a small oversight 20 years ago really still shapes the way that developers think about events today. So let's go back 20 years to 1994. You know, yeah, Speed had just come out. The Blue Album, right? It was a good time. How many of you guys remember design patterns? Congratulations, you've dated yourself. Right? This was a really influential book. For those of us doing C++ or even Java programming at the time, it was, a, a, you know, these four authors, the gang of four, they got together and they looked at how people were solving various problems in software development, and they codified those patterns into a book. And it's a very influential book, and it's still an influential book to today. Now, anybody remember this diagram, this sprawling diagram in the book? Basically what they did is they laid out all the patterns, and they laid out how they were related to each other. And, and today I'm only going to focus on two of these patterns. Specifically, the iterator and the observer pattern. Now, who knows what the iterator pattern is? Can you tell me? Put my hands up. Not a lot of JavaScript programmers are using the iterator pattern. However, it's going to be the next version of JavaScript, so I'll explain it to you right now. With an iterator, it's basically a common way of traversing the data in any particular collection. So you can walk up to an array or a set or any kind of or a linked list and ask it for an iterator and pull data progressively one by one from that iterator. And so you keep calling next, get some data, call next, get some data, and then finally the iterator will say, no more data for you. It's done, right? The observer pattern is actually the direct, you know, the, the, today's pub sub model, event emitter, subscribing to events, is actually a direct descendant of the observer pattern. Back in C++, we had a lot more ceremony around it. We had like a class. Nowadays, we have got JavaScript, so we just have a closure. And we give that closure to a data producer, and that data producer just pumps data at us one item at a time, progressively. One thing that the guys behind design patterns missed is the innate correspondence between these two patterns. Really, they're both about a data producer progressively giving information to a consumer one item at a time. Now, the only real difference is that in the observer pattern, the producer iterates you, right? <laughs> you give it a callback, and it keeps calling that callback and pumping data at you until what? Well, that's the interesting thing about the observer pattern and the iterator pattern. There's a slight difference. In the iterator pattern, the, 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 designer, the design patterns guys gave a way for the producer to say to the consumer, you know what, no more data. But now that we fast forward 20 years and we look at PubSub and we look at event emitter and we look at you know, DOM events, there's no way for the producer to say to the consumer, there's no more data. Think about document on load, for example, right? Thing only fires once, but then it sits around and holds on to your event handler, right? Just waiting to leak memory in case you forget to uh, unhook it. What happens if we take all of the semantics that are in the iterator pattern and put them into the observer pattern? It, we'll find that we can code events, do event-based programming in a dramatically different way than we do today, and in fact, code it in much the same way as we would against an in-memory collection. So the question I want to ask you guys is, really, what's the difference between an array and an event? What I'm going to tell you guys today is that they're really both collections and that you can actually use the same type of collection style programming you're used to for processing arrays and use it on events and end up writing much cleaner, more declarative code that's you know, devoid of memory leaks or race conditions. Before we do that, a, first ja a quick JavaScript 6 tutorial. Now, I want to point out the technology I'm going to teach to you today has nothing to do with JavaScript 6. I'm putting it up here for one reason, well, two reasons, really. One, it's got a nice little few syntactic affordances which are going to shorten the code on my slides, and as I mentioned, I'm on TC39, so I want people to get excited about JavaScript 6. I'm only going to show you one feature. A lot of you are probably already aware of it. Next coming now in JavaScript 6, you can get rid of all the ceremony around Lambda functions, and you can just replace it with a nice little arrow. Ah, isn't that nice? Yeah. Hell yeah. So functional programming is about to get a lot easier in the next version of JavaScript. And so from now on, if you're new to this, if this is new to you, whenever you see arrow, just think function. So now I'm going to take a look at some of the most flexible functions you'll ever learn, and probably most of you already know, but you don't know just how flexible they are. So 
Let's take a look at 4-H. This doesn't even count. Everybody knows 4-H, right? Over array, what's going to happen here? If I press a button, we're going to see it just evaluates one, two, it's going to log one, two, three. So 4-H calls a function for every item in the array, and then we're free to do something with that data, like log it to the console. Quick show of hands, who's used map before? Or knows what map is? Okay, a lot of people, so I'll skip over this real quick. I take an, a collection, I apply a function to every item in that collection, and I generate a new collection. So in this case, we're going to take one, two, three, add one to each item, get two, three, four. Filter, I'm going to assume most of you know what filter does. Pretty much the same thing, almost. We create a new collection just like before. In fact, all the operators I'm going to show you guys, with the exception of for each, creates a new collection. However, in the case of filter, we're going to apply a test function to each item, and if it doesn't pass the test, we're going to leave it out of the collection. So in this case, just yell it out. What's, the, uh, what's this array going to contain? Two, three, right, okay. Now this is a method that does not exist in JavaScript, but it would take like no time at all to add it to the array prototype if we wanted to. Concatall takes a multi-dimensional collection and reduces it, flattens it by one level. And so with this, we would get one, two, three, four, right? Now the significance of concatall is going to become clear in a moment. So quick review, map, filter, concatall. Okay, so hands up, who's a Netflix user? Yeah, that's what I like to see. All right, almost the whole room. That's beautiful. So you guys know Netflix, right? Netflix, in the company, we have an affectionate term for the grid that you see here, and we call it the LOLAMO, or list of list of movies, because that's really the Netflix domain model. It's a bunch of genre lists, each of which contains a bunch of titles. Right? So we've got our genre lists and inside our titles. So let's use these three functions, map, filter, and concatal, to get a list of your favorite Netflix titles. So I'm going to create a get top rated films function. It's going to accept a user. And then it's going to map over every genre list in that user's genre list collection. Now for every single one of those genre lists, we're going to extract the videos collection. But before we return it, we're going to filter those videos for only those videos with a rating of five. Now, that's going to leave us with a two-dimensional collection because for every genre list, we return another collection, albeit filtered. So we apply concat all to flatten it out into a single flat list of all your favorite videos. And then we just for each over the results and log it to the console. I'm just going to let that sink in for a moment. Does that blow anybody's mind or is that pretty straightforward? So what if I told you that I could create a mouse drag event with nearly the same code that I just wrote up there. <laughs> prove it, all right. I heard prove it. Top rated movies collection, so I want you to walk, look closely or you'll blink and you'll miss it, okay? Ready? What is a mouse drag? In fact, what is an event? If an event is a collection, I should be able to process it in much the way I processed an array. Well, a mouse drag is, a bunch, is we listen for a mouse down, and then we listen for all the mouse moves until a mouse up occurs, right? So I'm going to take the mouse down, I'm going to create a get element drags function, and it accepts a DOM element. And let's imagine that every DOM element, instead of events with add event listener and remove event listener, actually has a first class object for an event. And it's just called mouse downs. And so we map over the mouse downs, we return the document level mouse moves, so we can listen to the mouse moves at the document level. And before we use filter to reduce the items in this collection. But in this particular case, we're going to use this new operator take until, which I'll explain. All take until does is it listens to items from one collection, source collection, and then completes the collection as soon as another event fires. Now that leaves us with a two-dimensional collection, because for every mouse down, we're going to get the whole collection of all the mouse moves that happen after that. And so we flatten that two-dimensional collection with concat all, and then we for each over the nice flat results of all the mouse drags. This code actually works. So how is this possible? Well, it's possible with a new collection type called observable. Now, observable is a very overloaded term around here, I noticed. Um, I'm not talking about an ember observable. Right, where we have a property value that changes over time. I'm talking about something very similar to an event, except that it's an event that ends. It's an event that can tell you it's done. We've really built the correspondence between the iterator pattern that was introduced 20 years ago, finally, with now PubSub. We've unified them by giving PubSub the ability to say, I'm done. And as we'll see later, an error occurred, right? which is really fully unifying those patterns. Because if I ask an iterator for the next item, it can always throw. So we need the same correspondence on the observer side. We need a well-defined way of saying an error occurred. 
So the observable comes from a library called reactive extensions. And that's basically just this observable type, which I'll explain in a moment, plus all of the array functions you know and love on your JavaScript array implemented on that observable, as well as many more. Because you can, any array function you can implement on an observable, because events and arrays are actually fundamentally the same. They're collections. So this has been ported to C, C Sharp, BB.net, JavaScript, and Java. Actually, Netflix has ported it to Java. So if you do any Java server-side coding, I urge you to check it out, RxJava. So observables are so powerful for building UIs because they can compose three of the most elemental things of any UI, and that is events, asynchronous data requests, and animations. Observable can model each of these things and allow you to combine them all together using just a few functions, the functions I showed you earlier. So if I want to convert a, what I call a legacy event, like a document on load, or excuse me, a, a, an add event listener, to an observable, it's as simple as this. I just go observable from event. Now, if I'm subscribing to an event, we're all used to this process, right? We do add event listener and we do remove event listener. You could do the same thing with an observable. It just works slightly differently. When you are listening to an event, you're really traversing it. You're really using for each. It's really the same thing as with subscribing up to an event handler. Now, when you call for each over an observable, it returns this little subscription object. And if you want to unsubscribe, you just call this bills on it. Now, this isn't particularly remarkable. These two things are roughly equivalent, adding an event listener and removing an event listener, and then getting a subscription object back and disposing of it when you're not interested in the stream anymore. But Observable adds two more callbacks to for each. And this is how we unify anything you can do with an in-memory collection like an array with an event or pub sub. The next two callbacks you see there, one is for receiving an error that occurs anywhere in the whole asynchronous operation. What it does is it gives us the same affordance that we have in synchronous programming. If you have an error in synchronous programming, you can catch it way up here at the top of the stack. Observable does the same thing. If you compose many observables together and an error occurs anywhere in that computation, it does the exact same thing. It propagates it all the way up to your for each, and then you can handle it there. And then finally, we can get a callback that tells us when the stream has completed. Now, this particular stream, mouse moves, will never complete because it's really just taking the legacy DOM event API, and it's converting it to an observable. And DOM events have no well-defined way of saying they complete. But as we can see from earlier, we've taken till, we can complete collections ourselves. And that's actually very fundamentally different than the way we approach event-based programming today. When we're done listening to an event today, we unsubscribe. I don't unsubscribe. In fact, I haven't unsubscribed to an event in five years. And my code isn't littered with memory leaks because instead of unsubscribing from an event, I declaratively say when that event or observable completes. And once an observable is completed and it has no more data for me, well, it just frees the subscription for me. It's about a declaratively saying when you're not interested in that event anymore. And that's what take until does, that example you saw earlier. So, you know, there is no observable in JavaScript 6, and there's no special syntax for it, but I'm going to introduce one just so that you guys can see how an observable works and we can see how it all, all sort of fits together visually. So here's just an observable. It's just a collection over time. We for each over it, the exact same thing happens as when we for each over an array, except the items arrive over time. Right? So that's how you use an observable. Now map, predictively, the same thing. Right? We get our items, but they just arrive over time. For each doesn't run synchronously, it runs asynchronously. Filter, you guys can probably guess what's going to happen. Sorry. And concat all. So just a quick review on concat all. Remember, we take a two-dimensional collection and flatten it by one dimension. The same thing can be done with a two-dimensional observable. In other words, an, ev a, an event stream of other event streams that arrive over time. Now, it turns out that most UI problems can actually be solved and modeled this way. In fact, it's an ideal way to model most concurrency problems as an observable of observables. So we'll see what happens when we apply concat all to an observable of observables. Now, one of the challenges around concurrency is that if you subscribe to three different events at the same time, you really can't control in which order they're all going to fire. Now, if I loop over three arrays, one after the other, the order is assured, right? The runtime makes, it's because it's all synchronous, the runtime makes sure that things happen in the order I want them to. Now, sometimes I don't care that events fire in any particular order, but sometimes I do. Sometimes, in fact, that's the essence of where race conditions emanate from, right? If you subscribe to an event and you get a value back before you expect some other value to come back. 
Can cat all as a tool that we can use to control for race conditions? We can say, no matter in what order these event streams appear, I want you to flatten them and maintain the order in which they appeared. Have you ever made two asynchronous requests and the first one that you made came back after the second one that you made? Concatall is how you resolve that race condition. We'll see that in action in a moment. So the way concatall works is first we receive an observable, and then it fires a value, and we immediately return that. Then next comes along another observable. The first one completes. We fire the first value that comes out of it. And eventually, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the value 3 to come out of that second observable, another observable comes along, and concatall just buffers it up. It just waits. doesn't for each over it just yet. And then another, in fact, observable comes along, it just waits, buffers it up, and then finally three arrives. And then at the end, it makes sure that four is returned in the order in which it arrives. So does everybody see how concatall works over an observable of observables and how we can use it to resolve race conditions? So now I'm going to show you an example of, sorry, bear with me. So now take until, the example that you saw earlier. Take until takes two event streams. One is used as a source of data. And the other one is used as an indication of when to stop. And so overall, it creates a single observable that as soon as it finishes, unsubscribes from both the source collection and the stop collection, and basically just frees your subscription for you. So I have a source collection, one, two, three. But in the meantime, before we can get to three, four, some value comes out of the stop collection, and we just finish the observable. So we only get one, two, and then stop. So as I said earlier, you don't have to subscribe from events if events can tell you when they're done. You can just declaratively describe when the event stream should finish, and then it should free your subscription for you. So there's other ways. Now that we see that we've got this two-dimensional observable, as soon as we add the dimension of time, it turns out there's other ways to flatten a two-dimensional collection. So you saw how concat all works earlier, right? So it reliably returns items in the order in which their event streams arrived. But there's a different way of flattening collections. Sorry, just quick review. So now hopefully you've seen all the, the way that those methods work, and you can understand this example, right? How take until works. We create a whole new collection that we traverse, and we get mouse drag events. And then in the meantime, we generate other event streams like mouse moves, but then we complete them every single time a mouse up happens, and we free our subscription to both mouse moves and mouse ups. But we never stop subscribing to mouse downs because Anybody could start another mouse drag at any time. So there's another way, I said earlier, there's another way to flatten a two-dimensional collection. And in fact, this is probably the most common pattern we use in our UI development. Anybody ever uh, created a button on screen that when somebody clicks, goes and does something asynchronous, right? And then it goes to your QA person. What's the first thing your QA person is going to do with that button? Hammer it, right? Bad things can happen when they hammer on that button. And this is one of the real fundamental challenges of concurrency and asynchronous programming. Right? How do you control all these callbacks that you've created or promises or whatever they are? Right? Switch latest, and this is why I said earlier, almost every UI problem can be solved with the right flattening pattern, and switch latest is probably the most common of them. So in switch latest, let's say every time they press that button, we generate a new observable that represents the response that we'll eventually get back from the server. And we just keep generating these observables all over the place. Now I'm going to use a flattening pattern to flatten that two-dimensional observable. Every time they press a button, we get a new observable. And that's really a stream of observables. I'm going to use a flattening pattern to flatten that out and make sure that as soon as they click that button again, we cancel the previous operation. We essentially just unsubscribe from that observable. That's how switch latest works. So the first observable comes along, we immediately return one, because it just pumps us data and says, I'm completed. The next one comes along, it immediately returns two, but before three can be returned, another observable comes along. And so what switch latest does is it just unsubscribes from the previous observable, and we never get the value three. Now this unsubscription process can actually cancel a pending request. You get the opportunity, if you create an observable, when somebody unsubscribes, to cancel a pending request. Now if it's an, if it's an XHR, it may or may not have gone out yet. You may have a buffer, you probably do in fact, around your remote requests you make, so you can actually remove it from the buffer before it even actually goes out, that request. And so the next observable comes along, it's got no data in it, so it just disappears. And then finally, we get four. And when that last observable completes, the whole thing is finished. 
So I'm going to show you now, who's, who's done an autocomplete box before? A lot of people, right? I remember when I first had to do an autocomplete box, I, I figured I'd be out of there at five. I thought it was an easy problem, no problem, right? Lickety split, and I'd just go. Turns out an autocomplete box, maybe nowadays we've got a lot of affordances with things like jQuery mobile or, or controls. It's actually a particularly challenging problem though, isn't it? There's two async problems that you immediately run into with a Netflix search, and that is if somebody types A, B, C, D, E, F, I don't want to send off seven requests, right? So I want to do some, I want to introduce a little concurrency. I want to maybe use a timer to throttle all those outgoing key presses. The next problem is a much more thorny problem, and you see it all over the place in async pro programming, and that's the race condition. If I type A, and we send out a request for the search results for A, and then I type B, and we send out a, a request for the search results for AB, is there any guarantee that the search results for AB will come back after the search results for A? No. That's concurrency, right? And so if I don't do anything about that race condition, I might end up showing old search results. There were search results for A on top of the search results for AB. So how do we solve this problem? Here's a short example of how Netflix search works. Nowadays, I don't think in terms of events. I think in terms of collections. So I, cr I think about the collections that I have, and then I create, I compose those collections to create the collections that I want. Well, what collection do I want? I just want a collection of all the search result sets. And then I just want to for each over it, as you can see on the bottom. And I just want to update the UI. That's really what I want. I'm going to create that collection from the other collections I have available to me. So I'm going to start out with key presses, which is now just an observable. It's just a collection of all the key presses. A, B, D, F. And I'm going to throttle it. And so that, it's going to turn from A, B, D to A, D, F. Then I'm going to map it into whatever the current value of the search text box is, because I don't really care about the keys. I just want to grab the current value of the search text box. So now it's turned from A, C, F to A, A, C, A, C, F. Right? Now I'm going to do a filter because nobody wants to search for an empty string. Right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to just filter that. Anytime you've got an empty string in there, we're just going to filter it right out. And then I'm going to apply this operator distinct until change. Distinct until change is very, very simple. It just takes any, any se sequential values that are exactly the same and filters them out. So if you get A, 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 which you could get if somebody just hits left or right on the keys, right? If they hit left or right on the key arrow, they haven't changed the contents of the text box. So I can end up with A, A, A. Distinct until change just turns that into A. Then I'm going to take my search and I'm going to map it and I'm going to call a get JSON function. This function here returns an observable. It's an observable that eventually will just give me an array of the search results to display. And so now I've got a two-dimensional collection because for every single search that comes in, I've created another collection, albeit of just one value, but that's still a two-dimensional collection. And so what flattening pattern do I use to avoid my race condition with A and AB coming in in the right, wrong order? Switch latest. All I do is unsubscribe. As soon as the new collection of search results for AB comes along, I unsubscribe from A. And I'm left with a nice, flat list of all the search results to display in the UI. What have I done here? I've successfully separated all the functional programming, all the data in, data out. If you see everything on the above the fold on this particular slide is just data transformation. In fact, I haven't changed a single value. Every single one of these operators returns an entirely new collection. I haven't changed a thing. The only place in which I change something is right at the end when I for each over the results and then I update the UI. And that's what we've seen in Netflix's code over time as we use this model to handle event-based concur concurrency. We essentially just cleanly separated code which does data transformation from the code that updates the UI. Now this particular approach is totally compatible with some of the frameworks out there, Ember, React, right? It's just about building more complex events from simple events. Now how you choose to update your UI is really up to you if you want to use two-way data binding, but everybody's got to deal with events. And we've all got these simple events, mouse, mouse move, mouse up. When we're dealing with functions, we take small functions and we compose them into bigger functions that do what we need to. When we're dealing with events, it's notoriously difficult to compose events, and that's really because of the way that they're structured. Now that we've solved this problem around composing events, we can do the same thing with events that we do with functions. Take small events and compose them together into complex events. And then, when you want to update the UI, it's just a for each. 
And you could change your model or you could change the DOM directly any way you want. So I've got some time left. Is there any questions? We have a couple of resources for you guys. Um, one is, internally, we have a training program which we teach reactive extensions using this particular link up here. You can go take a look. Or sorry, that last link down there. You can do these exercises and we'll basically teach you how to do array-based programming. You'll go from using loops and array-based programming to using map, filter, reduce, merge, and zip to solve problems. And then once you're really good with map, filter, reduce, merge, and zip over array, you get to be able to use it over observable to build complex events. So that link right there at the bottom, learn RX, will help you learn to do this type of vector programming over events. Um, and you can check out RxJS, which is the library up there, and uh, RxJava, which is our Netflix is, uh, implementation of Rx for Java. Any questions about this slide here or overall the presentation? Yep. Right. Uh, like that. Where do you access that ah, well, so the DOM event, the, the, the data that it gives you when it invokes your callback, that becomes the data in the stream. So when I convert my DOM event to an observable, really all I'm doing is I'm creating a stream of all those little event objects that come out. So if we see, look up here. So once you create those, are the event objects in the DOM? Yes. So this will actually give me a stream of all the event objects that you get whenever you do a mouse move. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, sure. So at Netflix, we use an internal training program. Basically, the idea is we want to train our developers to start thinking in terms of vector programming. Now, who knows that term vector programming? Right, we got a few people. Not all JavaScript programmers are familiar with it, but the idea has been around for a really, really long time. Vector programming is really these functions that you saw earlier, map, filter, reduce, merge, and zip, um, and concat all. The idea is to structure your program in terms of transformations over collections. Now, that really can replace loops almost entirely. With the exception of that for each loop at the end, you really don't need to use loops to do a lot in your program. Now, Vector programming isn't just good for asynchronous operations. Can anybody tell me what's one of the biggest shifts that we've had in hardware over the last five years? Parallelism. Processors stopped getting faster and they started multiplying. Now, we as JavaScript programmers may think, oh, that's somebody else's problem, right? We don't have threading. What do we got to worry about, right? I know there's some folks in there who see this and don't think, oh, I don't have to worry about that, right? The reality is right now, in the JavaScript Standards Committee, we are standardizing an approach which will allow shared memory parallelism. And it works exactly like this. It works with map, filter, reduce, merge, and zip. The amazing thing about map is it doesn't really matter in what order you process the items, does it? If I want to parallelize a map operation over a large array, it's trivial. So right now, we're actually working at standardizing that. And we actually you have early versions in Mozilla right now. So as we start to do more and more computationally intensive things in JavaScript, which people like uh, the React folks are doing, right? They're doing a lot of computationally intensive work in JavaScript. We want to be able to leverage all those cores and compete with native apps. And so learning vector programming is really about learning the next 10 years of software development. It's about learning to think at a higher level. It's about learning to talk about what we want to have happen instead of with a loop describing in excruciating detail exactly how it has to happen. And so learning vector programming doesn't just help you with concurrency, it helps you with parallelism. And that's why it's so important to learn vector programming. And it doesn't matter if you're a JavaScript programmer or a server programmer or anybody. Does that make sense? So we're currently teaching our developers how to, uh, how to do vector programming. And we use exactly that link that I showed you there at the bottom. Thanks very much, guys.